Hello, ghouls and goblins. Welcome back to <laughs> Bride of Alternate Ending. I'm your co-host, Brennan Klein. I'm here with, who the fuck are you? Tell me who you are. Hi, I'm Timothy Brayton. Hi, Tim. Um, th- so, this is our second episode of November, everyone. <laughs> happy happy November. Mm-hmm. I hope everyone's looking forward to Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's it's been a bit of a, a wild time over here. I was sick. I lost my voice, which is why the other one got delayed, and it's kind of cascaded into a whole domino effect. We're we're trying to get back on uh, back on board with everything before yeah, the end was, of the year. It was, it was perfect because then I got sick, and uh, and here we are with our first of three December episodes. <laughs> yeah. So you know, really, it's our holiday treat to you is the three episodes just like Hanukkah when they thought that the oil wouldn't last eight days like we have (laughs) we thought there were two episodes and there's three episodes I love that thank you um happy Hanukkah by the way we are recording this during Hanukkah for anyone who celebrates um also there's Christmas and all those other things that you've heard of um but my fa- my my new phrase that I'm going to use. Um, I was watching the. I, I mean, not on purpose. It was for work. Um, I was watching the DC Fandom, which is their which was their big like uh, live stream thing where they were announcing a bunch of shit that nobody cared about. Um, and they said gift giving season is coming up. <laughs> I mean, it ain't not gift giving giving season. Exactly. So happy gift giving season, everyone. <laughs> Anyway, our gift to you is, as of November of this year, it was the 30th anniversary of Wes Craven's 1991 feature, The People Under the Stairs, came out on November 1st, 91. Um, so we're going to talk about it. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, I believe, potentially making a little little Wes Craven mini event for our December podcasts, but uh, we'll... we'll get into those details later as we need to yes we will no spoilers i mean we will probably at the end um but yes so tim i'm was this a first time watch for you it turns out that it was not uh i apparently watched this film in august of 2014 and formed zero memories of it i as i was watching and as these images were unspooling in front of my eyeballs i had no they were triggering no experience for me and yet clear as a bell on, on the list that I use to chart when I see movies, August 20th, 2014. So, uh, so apparently I have, but I'm not going to count it as such. Okay. Well, that, that is the movie. Did you find like, okay. So looking back on the fact that you completely forgot watching this movie, do you find that to be, something that makes sense or are you shocked that you completely forgot you saw it i i think at a minimum the fact that there is a movie where big ed hurley wears a full body gimp suit should have put some stakes in my brain and and i think it's on me that i don't somehow remember at least that much of the film yeah cuz like if you've seen this movie that is that's the thing <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so I was really curious because I you had said you hadn't seen it, but I saw on your letterbox it was um, you know, a, a it was review. As yeah, it was marked as watched in your whatever whatever list you imported when you first started Letterboxd, and I was like, hmm. <laughs> um Okay, so did you like it? <laughs> uh not as much as you, that's for sure. Um I think it does a lot of things that are interesting. Uh, do we do we want to talk about the movie itself before we talk about sort of responses to it or yeah or? yeah let let's do that I'm just I, I've just been because because it's about going this process to, for you it's going to re, it's going to require me talking about elements of of the plot in order to make any heads or tails of what I liked and didn't like so I feel it, it might be easier just to have that laid in yeah of course you know well um okay so in as as basic as i can make it um the lead character of this movie is a young uh black kid named fool um he lives in this extremely horrible like tenement building in los angeles 
Um, and he needs to make money really quick in order to pay rent so that his family isn't evicted because they're the last family in the building um, because the landlords want to tear it down and put up new shiny condominiums for white people. Mm -hmm. Um, So Ving Rames, which is his sister's boyfriend, um, he basically enlists Fool to help him and a friend uh, break into the house of the landlords and steal this kind of collection of gold coins that they have that is invaluable, apparently. Um, but of course, once they get into the house, they realize that they're trapped in there with the their victims, essentially. And it's this kind of grotesque charnel house that looks like, you know, an idyllic suburban home on the outside and on the inside is this uh, horrible booby-trapped maze. Um, and in the basement are a bunch of rejected, perfect children that failed to follow the rules and have had pieces carved out of them and they're shoved in the basement and they're these kind of grotesque pale monsters yes and and let us just clarify for the sake of of being precise the basement's location is under the stairs it's therefore is. they are the people who live there but aren't we all the people under the stairs <laughs> no I, I mean <laughs> that seems to be one of the available readings of this film yes <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the basics of it. There's, um, well, but, but ultimately, okay. So mommy and daddy, as they're credited, um, are played by Wendy Roby and Everett McGill reuniting after Twin Peaks. And they're, you know, kind of this Fellini-esque grotesque depiction of suburban parents who are like extremely abusive and want everything to look perfect to the point that they will destroy everything to get that. Yes. Uh, and it's also worth noting it it is a as far as I can tell a fairly standard talking point among uh, reviewers of this film to suggest that they are caricatures specifically of uh, Ron and uh, Nancy Reagan mm-hmm. Ronald I should say and that is true at the level certainly of hair and makeup um, I think I think calling them Fellini esque like carnival creatures is probably more on point because. I feel the Reagan parody feeds into that, although it's not the only thing there, but it is it is there. So I think it's it's at least worth sort of acknowledging that that's clearly there's satire going on for sure. Yes. There's lots of satire going on, uh, but that is one tendril of the satire. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, for for me, like it is this movie is specifically entrenched in that, but it also. It's very much speaking to kind of a broader theme that exists throughout Wes Craven's work, which is the dichotomy between, like, just basically, like, exposing the skeletons in the closet of the idyllic suburban home. Right. Um, like, you know, the, the, the one film, or one of the films that I, I think you can unabashedly support by Wes Craven, because I love him a lot more than you seem to, um, in A Nightmare on Elm Street, it's the same thing. It's, you know, the, the sins of the parents falling on the heads of the children, because they, like, all of these supposedly, you know, perfect houses on Elm Street are, are owned by these people who murdered Freddy Krueger and are, you know, he's getting revenge and so on. Right. And even, even if you go back, uh as far as his, his sort of big two grindhouse era oh, yeah. hits where he made his name, Last House on the Left and, and Hills Have Eyes, uh, those are both in their way about the the extremely slender thread that holds together nice suburban people from being just like murderous animals in, in the right circumstances. Yeah, and, and uh, okay, I, I mean, I wrote a whole essay about this, but um, basically, <laughs> like Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes both um, pit a you know an idyllic like nuclear family against this kind of grotesque mirror version of themselves right and reveal the grotesquery within the supposedly quote-unquote normal family um so yeah this is something he's been doing since the beginning and so i i, I was kind of viewing it through that lens but yes this particular entry is very specifically mired in the reagan era trickle down politics of it all oh absolutely absolutely very very clearly an economic based horror film uh apparently there was a time when jordan peele sort of had circled this as being something he might be interested in remaking which feels extremely explicable like very much tapping into themes of uh economic oppression how that intersects with racial oppression um sort of communities being turned into commodities by the people who who have like the money and the power over them 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I, I do think that this film, I mean, this film has two primary functions um, or that it succeeds in. Um, and one of them is in being that kind of text that's delivering that s- story and that theme. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is to be this kind of unmitigated cartoon nonsense machine. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And note, please note that the the way that it is not fully functioning is perhaps as a horror film. Um, it has moments within it that I think are good at horror. Uh, the moment, so so the the evil, horrible, scary Reagan type mommy and daddy have uh, a Rottweiler. And at one point, the Rottweiler brings a like mutilated, severed hand to them. Great moment. Really, really freaked me out a little bit. So there is there is horror within this film. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely gore within this film. Okay. Well, the the thing about this film, though, is that th- there certainly is gore, but it is extremely ill conceived gore for the most part. Like most of the gore and the makeup effects of the titular people under the stairs is not particularly well done. There is a just shockingly poor moment, and I I don't know if this goes quite far enough into the film to be a spoiler, but I'll I'll avoid putting details just to be safe. Uh so they 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 take the the, the children who misbehave, they mutilate them, they throw them under the stairs, uh, and one of them demonstrates this by by sticking out his severed tongue oh yeah no, that, and that, it is i was gonna say it is it is a fake ass looking severed tongue i think yeah and and there, there's also kind of a texas chainsaw-esque like body being carved up and it it looks it looks like a mannequin with some bolo- bologna on it <laughs> it looks like a mannequin with some bologna on it for sure yeah so uh, i think that at least in terms of what i mean in terms of what um, film or uh, film goers would come to expect in the late '80s from a horror film, and obviously this came out in the early '90s, which is an extremely anemic era for horror. Um, it, it it's it's not delivering on that level of what one might expect from a horror film. Um, <clears throat> I do think um, that this move, where this move, this this movie's tone shines the brightest, is the way that. Um, camp can slide into the uncanny um and that is that is an aspect of horror but it's just not um what one might expect this type of movie to be delivering right and i I do think it's worth saying i don't believe the somewhat unpersuasive gore effects to be a mistake i think that the film's mode is goofy in ways that having really detailed disgusting gore would work against so i think there's a degree to which it's meant to look a little fake and cheesy because being visceral horror isn't the film's goal being a kind of off the wall campy satire is yes absolutely and i I do think it largely succeeds in that but do you do you agree with me is the question uh so so this gets us to our our question of did I like this movie and why I sort of hemmed and hawed. Uh, I, I do not believe that I agree that it works <laughs> in this particular case. Um, the, so, so there's things that need to be like sort of disentangled. I think there's campiness, there's satire and there's just like jokes and the, the jokes the just the parts of it where it's just kind of like a, a goofy movie and it is frequently just a goofy movie. Uh, I think it is relying extensively on Wendy Roby and only Wendy Roby to sell that. And I think <laughs> she succeeds at it. But there's there's parts of the movie where it just it feels like. I just don't think Wes Craven is someone who can do comedy It's sort of the vibe that I get from this movie to a certain extent. Uh, it feels like it's playing very broad. And certainly I think Everett McGill, when he is being called to do big wacky comedy is uh is somewhat at a loss for how to do it well okay <clears throat> i i hear you on that i i will throw you to that end um any of ving rames's quips are pretty terrible um yes but ving rames is an actor who has the 
if Ving Rhames says it, I believe it. Uh huh. Basically, so I, I I agree that the quips are terrible, but also they didn't bother me because he's Ving Rhames. Yeah, yeah, just on on the page. Um, <clears throat> and Wes Craven does have a very goofy kind of middle aged man dad sense of humor that doesn't really always connect. Like I I find it endearing, but it's certainly not quite funny. <laughs> Um, so I'm, 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 I'm with you on that, but I just think that the energy of this movie, I find really propulsive and it really, like when it, when it hits those completely over the top beats, it does just, it does work for me. And, and that's fair. And I, I can certainly see where someone would love this movie. Like it, it's not one of those things where I'm just like, I don't get it. I get it. I just, I don't think I'm there with it. Yeah, no, that, that's to- obviously totally fine. Um, and, and this to me movie is, I mean, it is one of like, it's in my top 10 Wes Craven movies for sure. Maybe even low in my top five. I'd have to look at it again. It's probably not. Um, I I will say this, uh, as I was watching the film and, and feeling, and this, this might get us a little bit too broad. So we might want to put this down and then walk away from it and come back to it. Uh, I was, I was kind of wondering, like, I, I just, I wasn't gelling with the film. Like I, I think it's it's got moves that I admire. I, I'm at a three stars with it. I would say so. It's not like I disliked it. Mm-hmm. But as I was sitting there watching it, I was like, "This is something's just not in my brain firing." So I decided to to after the movie just throw together a real quick um, uh, ranking of Wes Craven's films. Oh, great! I have seen I have seen 15 of his features, and I can say that I do have this in, in my Wes Craven top five. Uh, I can also say that. Top five is the number of Wes Craven films that I have a positive response to, and the remaining ten are all films that I, to some degree, don't like. So I, I think I just don't like Wes Craven. Yeah, and and that that is something that we know, or at least we we know, like fundamentally, like the the kind of backbone of his career is the Scream franchise, which you do not have very much space for in your heart. Um, and I am the opposite, so we kind of are coming at him from two different directions. Um, well, I, I think what what threw me about making that realization, and I I I just kind of realized it last night when I was watching the film. Uh, I love 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 The Hills Have Eyes. I think it's a fucking masterpiece, and it feels like if you love 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 that movie, you have to love Wes Craven because that's one of his weird, prickly, hard to deal with movies. Uh, and so I I want to like Wes Craven because because of that movie but uh but i don't know i just a lot of his stuff i'm just not not doing anything for me yeah no that's totally fine um well i mean obviously sorry um yeah so i'm curious what your top five are like on this list that you have well let me uh let me pull that up because because i wrote it down because i don't ever create top 10 lists that i don't write down of course uh so my top five with with I think some wiggle room in the ranking, but not the films. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hills Have Eyes, mm-hmm. New Nightmare, and uh, Red Eye uh, above People mm-hmm. Under the Stairs. Oh yeah, um, with the exception Hills Have Eyes, I don't love um, personally, but yeah, I would definitely have you know New Nightmare, Elm Street, probably Scream and Scream Two, and Red Eye, just off the top of my head above People Under the Stairs. Like I think this is a B plus tier Wes Craven, um, sure. for myself. Um, but I I do think that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this movie. Like I I I think obviously I can swallow that kind of like energy a lot easier than you found yourself being able to. But I I think that there's something in the the way that it like that that kind of camp and intensity interacts with the theme. And I think it works the best in the, this is semi a spoiler. So we might, uh, you know, put a little marker on it. If you want to see this movie, go see this movie. Um, but when a fool ends up in the kind of their vault where they keep all of their money and kind of all of the, uh, the riches that they have collected from the community, it's just, it, it, it's like he's stumbling. He's, it's like he's Sally Hardesty stumbling into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house. It is, it it is depicting wealth as this kind of grotesque mm. mess. Um, it it it's it it is almost grisly 
to look at, and it's just piles of money and coins everywhere. But it, it's it's kind of it's disgusting in in a way, and I, I think that 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 moment really highlights kind of what he's going for. And and I agree. I like that moment a lot. And I will say, I think the film is on its surest footing when it is the most aware of what it wants its social themes to be. Like I I think the parts that engage with that more or less directly, I think tend to work pretty well. Especially because I think those are the parts of the film where, where Bing Rames gets to do the most heavy lifting in some cases. That is also true. Because like, you, you do get to see a little bit of you know what, what life is like outside of this suburban house, and that is where Ving Rhames gets to shine the absolute most. Um, and this is certainly the best of the movies that deal with black themes that Wes Craven made. The Vampire in Brooklyn is the worst. Um, <laughs> Vampire in Brooklyn is one I have studiously avoided. <laughs> I think, okay, well, I mean, you, you can't trust me on, on this, but I think Vampire in Brooklyn is better than its reputation, although it is still not very good. <laughs> It could be better than its reputation and still be horrible, for the record. Yeah, but it's it look it stars Angela Bassett. Um, I mean, that's true. That's very true. So that really helps. Um, although Eddie Murphy does do his 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 thing, even though, like okay, I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, there's there's some interesting stuff in that movie, but if you don't like Wes Craven's humor, you're probably gonna eat less like that. Um, Serpent in the Rainbow is quite good. The other movie that he made about um voodoo rituals in Haiti but th- this one is the most specifically you know Jordan Peele-esque that is thinking about what's going on in society and like at least actively uh ruminating on that throughout the film um mm-hmm. at, you know and, and the the hit rate is how you view it and yeah and I I I don't want to to come across as like I just don't have any any patience for the the films like satire or even its campiness. Um, I think when it lands, it works really well for me. Uh, again, I think it lands. Generally speaking, when it's set when it's outside the house, I think it's good. Um, I, I think mm. its most serious moments, generally speaking, work for me. Um, I guess a, I just I think a big part of it is I, I just find the characterization of mommy and daddy so broad. It's it's not aiming at a target. It's just kind of like like wailing away as hard as it can at sort of the concept of Reaganomics in a mm-hmm. way that that feels it just it feels a little bit too big. And I think it it would benefit. I think it would benefit the satire from from sort of narrowing its focus. I I think it would certainly benefit the characterizations and Everett McGill, certainly. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I just there's there's moments like when he's in the gimp suit is one thing like that's kind of a deliberately shocking provocative moment, but like there's a thing where he's like waving a rifle up and down and he's really excited because he thinks he just shot someone, and I don't know if it's what Craven was having McGill do or if it's what what McGill was just sort of generating himself. The moment just felt too goofy to me to to do anything like like mm-hmm. i don't know not even campy really just kind of like silly yeah and okay i i hear you okay let me draw connections because for me the this performance is delivering well i mean it, it's kind of delivering what matthew lillard is doing in scream um like this kind of extremely broad cartoon character performance and i i love matthew lillard's performance in scream um but it's also kind of applying that to the kind of shrill like dinner party scenes at the end of like any texas chainsaw movie where it's just it's kind of a battering ram um but perhaps uh Wes Craven's battering ram is less powerful than Toby Hooper's battering ram, so it kind of uh, is watered down a little bit. And and it's it's hard to say because because the battering ram in Texas Chainsaw is it's clearly the best time that it ever worked for Toby Hooper as well. So yeah, exactly. You know. So it's it's we don't want to compare movies to Texas Chainsaw Massacre because many many of them don't don't survive that comparison. Exactly. Um, I will okay, I will yeah. say I think one one of the other specific things that I think I get a little hung up on. And this is me. Um, so you tell me, I have here this campy satire about how the suburbs are actually full of depraved people doing horrible, exploitative, violent things. And it stars Everett McGill and Wendy Roby. 
and I say, aha, I have also seen Twin Peaks. And I think I just vibe with Lynch's version of this Mm. so much more naturally than I vibe with Craven's version of it. And I think a big part of it for me was just like the presence of those two actors made it too hard for me to drop out of, but I could be watching Twin Peaks. Got it. Mode. (laughs) No, that's totally fair. And I mean, I've, I've seen the first season of Twin Peaks but it's not something that ever lived in my heart because I saw it as a kid and I just wasn't mm. wasn't ready for what David Lynch was doing. Yeah, as, as I think I'm literally on record on the site saying Twin Peaks might be my favorite television program. So yeah, so it it's yeah. just it it has no choice but to pale in comparison to that. Although I, I I as you said, I do think the movie lives and dies on the strength of Wendy Roby's performance oh, because I do I, think I do she is a genius. Yeah, no, I, I will say, um, I, I think I'm out of three stars with the movie, as I said. I would not be without Wendy Roby in it. She is she is holding the villain half of the movie together basically just by her screen presence. Yeah, and my God, I mean, for me, the most compelling horror moment of that is when she's uh, giving her daughter Alice a bath in that steaming, boiling bathtub. And yes. she's just this shrieking harpy creature that she turns into it's it's really it is a an incredibly disturbing (laughs) turn from her it is although actually i think my favorite moment in her performance is is a sort of weirdly low-key one Mm -hmm. uh it's towards the end and again it's going to be a bit of a spoiler uh they have just been obliged to feign that everything is going all right in front of some cops and she has a line that's to the effect of like oh i hope i never see a cookie again or something oh, uh. generally along those lines. And the the just like she pulls it so far back into just, you know, like a woman who's been scrubbing the floor for the last two hours and just saw another fucking piece of mud on the floor. Like it's not big, it's not campy, it's not like this kind of histrionic moment. And that to me just makes it feel so much sharper because she's been going big for so much of the movie. And I really like that little pivot in her energy a lot no i i definitely i completely on board with what roby is doing in this mm. movie for sure and i i think that what you were kind of dancing around is is correct in that she does modulate her performance more than ever mcgill ever does because he's constantly at the same level um but i am not immune to you know the the kind of energy of scenes like where Everett McGill shouts shut the fuck up at a dog and then turns around and gets punched in the dick by a child um like that that's just I enjoy that and that's just me <laughs> that's fair that's fair and no and I, I think a big part of, of what we're we're seeing here is is you click with Craven's humor in a way that I do not and you know this happens this is the the mystery of comedy sometimes it works and sometimes it don't yeah that's that that's just you know we what Oh, never mind. Just, you know, we, you know, people are like, you know, it, it takes all kinds to build a world. And I mean, I, it, that seems to be the case, although obviously I'm the only one with the right opinion. So it, it's weird to of me. Course. Um, and, and I will say, I find the, the over the top humor elements of this film to be merely not my thing. Whereas in something like Last House, I think they actively destroy the movie. So like, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to, I don't want to say this is like, oh my god, this is the worst. Like even in Wes Craven, there's there's worse comedy than what we're seeing here. Oh yeah, I I think he put that into Last House on the Left, so no one could ever, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so he, they, everyone would have something to negatively compare even his worst comic beats to. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I yeah, I mean, ultimately. That that just kind of speaks to me, and there's this kind of the, just the kind of like goofy death trap fun house of of the the like production design of the house is super fun. I really like you know moments like the the dog sliding down a chute and just coming out of the uh, kitchen cupboard and slamming into the wall, just like little kind of manic things like that. Just kind and, of speak. To and me. I like that, and actually that that puts me in mind of something we haven't talked about like at all, which is the plot really of the film and what's going on. This isn't a film about two crazy Republican psychos like butchering people. It's a film about a little kid stuck in a haunted house. Yes. yes, yes, And, yes. and other than, other than mentioning him, we haven't really done anything. And I actually like that part. Um, I think uh, I forget the actor's name offhand. Brandon Adams. Have... 
he's quite good. He's oh, he's a he very, is, very strong child actor. He's a surprisingly compelling child actor. Like, he's, he, you know, he, he's not. I wouldn't. He's not in the like upper echelon of like, you know, there, there are child performances where you're like, are you an adult that got shrunken down? Um, but he, he does have this kind of gravity to him that also aids the movie a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that's for sure part of it. I also think that there's just a, I mean, it's an R-rated very gory very in some ways fucked up movie but it has a kind of goonies vibe in a lot of ways where Mm. it feels like an 80s kids adventure when you see him like going in and out of all of these secret passageways and as you say like there's a scene where a dog shoots down a slide but there's also this like supremely ridiculous moment towards the end that i think does not work but at the same time it does not work in a very charming way where he's uh he's in a uh, chimney and he slides down the chimney to try and like land on on uh, mommy's head mm-hmm. and the the editing completely fails that moment like it, it doesn't look even the slightest bit real but there's a kind of like we had 30 bucks and we thought we could make it work level that feels like the right energy for a sort of silly mm-hmm. kids movie so it feels almost like he's the protagonist of this like funky kids film wedged into this weird Wes Craven-y grindhouse film about like mutilating children. And and I like that part of it. I like I like the set. I like him interacting with the set. I like him sort of skulking around this this haunted looking house that's like dark, but not so dark that it feels like an actual again, because it's not really doing horror as we touched on. So so the cinematography is a little bit bright, but I think that kind of gives it more again of that kids movie vibe. Yeah, and, and and speaking to that, like it, it also does kind of have this fairy tale quality too, where there there's not a lot of specificity to the characters. Like it is kind of a like this is mother, this is father, and then this kid is just trapped in this you know funhouse mirror version of a family. Um, it's very Hansel and Gretel too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the and- fact that there's like a a secret basement under the stairs. Where the bad children are, are prisoned, and that's mm. very fairy tale. Yeah, exactly. And and then also speaking to the the Goonies adventure of it all, that that uh, <coughs> kind of that trick that he pulls on Everett McGill in the uh, the vault room, um, where he's trying to distract him from uh, realizing where the where he actually is. So Fool has kind of jammed these gold coins into a candle, and as the candle melts, the coins fall and make a noise. Right. Um, and that kind of you know, in, ingenious kid booby trapping and whatnot. I mean, it goes to it goes to Home Alone. It goes to a lot of like that kind of that kind of filmmaking. No, totally, and and I I like that about it. I I think it's it works. I I think I would not want Wes Craven to make a children's movie, but making a kind of weird adult parody of a children's movie, I think, is a good. He's a good fit for that, and I think this works on that level. Yeah, and that's something he can do. Like he more directly interacted with the Hansel and Gretel fairy tale in um, the third act of Wes Craven's New Nightmare, and I think he did that really well. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> um, but yeah, ultimately, that that that's the that's the gist of the um, movie. Is there anything else that you think it's doing well that we haven't covered? Um. I mean, I think we've covered most of the things that that sort of struck me about it. Uh, again, it's it's a it's a very thoughtful satire. I think one that maybe maybe goes for easier targets than I think it think it's going for, but that's not a problem. And I, I like the child acting. I like the the sort of fairy taleness of it. Um, but certainly, I, I know you have you have much stronger opinions about this film than I do. Uh, do you have anything that we haven't touched on that you really want to make sure we we sort of look at? Um, well, uh, sure. Uh, actually, uh, uh, this, I don't think is like particularly strongly tied through the movie as well as in other pieces that Wes Craven has done. But I, I, I do think that the opening credits sequence is very compelling. Um, it yes. features, um, Fool's sister, who's played by Kelly Jo Minter, who's the, the, she was in Elm Street 5. She was the, the girl on the diving board that kind of turns into a hand, like a claw. Mm-hmm. Um, she is delivering a tarot reading for fool and basically kind of laying out the idea that he is a fool because he is unlearned and unlearned and hasn't 
like you know learned about the world yet and he's gonna go on this adventure and kind of trip into like learning about himself in the process of all of this and i i think it's a very ominous and interesting opening that does i I don't think it gets fully delivered on but i i really really like that and i think it ties in with a lot of the mysticism of what was craven does you know i i liked the opening a lot i i think it does promise a slightly different movie than the one we get but it's very very cool uh sort of reminds me a little bit of all things of um Cleo from five to seven. Which oh, I, I think we know that Wes Craven likes art cinema. So he's almost certainly seen this movie, especially mm-hmm. given when it came out and, and how old he is, uh, which also has this like very striking camera pointing directly down at a tarot reading sequence. Um, and I just, I don't know. I got the kind of the same, same vibe of it. The, the colors sort of hit me the same way. Uh, no, I really like that opening. My my one reservation, the font used for the credits themselves oh. is a real early '90s low budget horror movie font. But yeah. that's that's it is an early '90s horror, low budget horror movie, so we cannot judge it for that. Yeah, but it, it that you're you're right, the, especially the the title card. You're like, oh, you couldn't have uh, juiced that up a little bit. <laughs> yep, couldn't couldn't have used a serif. Yeah, Maybe. Jesus. Um. But yeah, so there is that. Um, and also, I, I do think that especially the when you see the family interacting with um, real outside people, specific, like mostly the cops, um, th- there is a lot in the satire that I do think reads really well and would deliver on a remake. Um, like these, they, they very specifically are playing people that I would encounter in the suburban neighborhood where I grew up. Like, except like we just live in the world of ring doorbells and next door and you know people being worried about package thieves or whatever um as opposed to like what's going on in 1991 Mm -hmm. exactly and and i do think i think a remake would actually be a very cool thing to see just because i i do think that satire is it's not what he's best at and i think someone who is better at it could maybe tease a little bit more out of out of that in a way that would would help the material yeah i agree like like i've said this this is like a b plus west craven movie for me i have a lot of love in my heart for it but um it it isn't like it it can be improved upon i wouldn't ever say like oh you can't touch the people under the stairs <laughs> like th- there's a lot in there that could be really really cool and um, for sure the last thing that i would say that i think is just a cool image um, is the pile of dead flies at the bottom of the windowsill because the house oh, sure. is such a prison that not even insects or the bugs can escape. No, that's that's a really, really good image. That's an excellent point. Mm-hmm. So that that's cool. And then, um, I mean, my last note that it's just we haven't covered at all is that I do think the score is kind of chintzy and crappy at certain points. It absolutely is. I think there's no doubt about that. But that, again, to me is kind of... At certain points in history and for certain genres, concessions must be made. It's a 90s horror film, and if its title isn't Candyman, a 90s horror film has a bad score, and that's just kind of that to me. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, 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 it isn't necessarily exceeding the limitations that it has, but especially in the realm of what horror was in the early 90s, with the exception oh, totally. of Candyman... It is an it it is an extremely exciting entry in that period. I mean, look at this in the context of of where the slasher film was, for example, at this point. Mm-hmm. It's clearly clearly it's better than that. Like like it's it's there's a lot of th- this is closer to being a peak of 1991 horror than a, a valley, for sure. I mean, I'm looking at what came out in 1991. We've got, what, body parts, something called The Boneyard, Howling Six, uh, uh, Ghoulies Go to College. I didn't know the Ghoulies went to college. Good for them. Oh, yeah, they did. Um, you know, they get their BA. Yeah. Um, okay, The Silence of the Lambs did come out in 91. And and I had thought about that, and, and I, I think there's something that's – cannibalism does not get a whole lot of play in American movies. How fucking weird is it that this movie in Silence of the Lambs came out the same year? That is a really interesting point. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it almost never comes up. It's it's too taboo for us for whatever reason. Um, 
But yeah, no, that's really weird. And yeah, and then 91 just had a bunch of other franchise stuff. Omen 4, uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Um, and Child's Play 3, which I think is okay, but it's a bottom tier Chucky movie. It, it is it is my single least favorite Chucky film and still not even close to the worst film you've just named. So No, no, no I'd say it's, for me, number three of the year from what I just read off. <laughs> um, and yeah, anyway, so... Yeah, especially like in the constellation of what was around, People Under the Stairs is a really remarkable film, even if it's not a complete success in every degree. Yeah, that's, that's I think, a very fair way to sum it up. Well, I, I think that's going to do it. And, and then you can, uh, you know, erase that from your memory yet again, and maybe we can revisit in 10 years and see if you've changed your mind. <laughs> I mean, it didn't even take, it only took seven years, so maybe we can okay, come perfect. back in, uh, in 2028. Exactly. We'll break a mirror and then we'll come back and watch this movie. Um, and once our bad luck has run out. Um, wow, that didn't make sense. Um, sometimes my jokes are great, and then other times they're not. Anyway, so I, I see the shape of the joke you were going for, and I approve of it. Thank you so much. Um, see, the thing is, sometimes people in my life will say, oh my God, you're so funny. Um, when I say a really good joke and they don't realize that I've been telling jokes for the past 30 minutes and that's the one that hit and the other <laughs> ones they didn't recognize at all. <laughs> um, but yes. So thank you so much uh, for listening to this late November episode. Um, we're going to, I'm just going to not make any promises about release dates for the next two episodes <laughs> right now. I think that's a good call. Um, but the episode that we're coming up with, which I'm going to tell you what my, my, my vision, I'm trying to manifest when this is coming out. Um, I want this next episode to be out by the 17th, um, of December and our current recording schedule can make that happen, but things can change. Um, but anyway, the next episode we're covering is the uh, Christmas horror movie that was voted for on the Patreon poll. We're going to be watching 1989's Elves, which is, um, by all accounts, an extremely wild entry that I've never seen. I, I have never seen it and had only heard of it when we when we put it down in the poll. So we'll see how how it goes. Yes. Um, the, the, the plot description of elves on, uh, IMDb is longer than the plot description for the, uh, Sargosa manuscripts. So, okay. It should be very I like interesting. That. I also like that. That's like your go-to comparison is, was this longer or shorter than the description of the Sargosa manuscript? I look, I, 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 I think no, all, it makes sense. All, I get all it. cinema is in the same arena, baby. I know, I get it. I totally do. And and that's a that's a salient comparison to make. Thank you so much. And and as as Tim teased earlier, um the for the second episode of December, um we're going to be doing another West Craven anniversary because December 1996 is when the original Scream came out. So we're going to be watching Scream for its 25th anniversary. And um, uh, and to prepare ourselves for the re- the the release of Scream in exactly. January. Exactly. Um, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> um, are you? I mean, we haven't. You know, I guess we'll we'll read your January preview. But I, I think that the phenomenon of years later sequels does not have a high enough hit rate that I am inherently excited for it. But it will surely not be the worst Scream film. I think that that is already a guarantee. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, and we'll, we'll catch you for elves as soon as our elves episode comes out. (laughs) (laughs) Good, good way. Good good play. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your patience, um, with, you know, just our bedraggled throats and bodies. Um, and we'll, I'm very excited for what we have coming up. So, uh, we'll see you then. Bye. Thanks everyone.